In the days following Jesus' resurrection, the Holy Spirit was poured out on the disciples and led them to preach the gospel in all places and to all people. As the good news of salvation spread and the early church grew, they faced new challenges and had to articulate their newfound faith. From the ascension of Christ and salvation for unexpected people to shipwrecks and testimony before kings, the Book of Acts has much to teach us about living by the Spirit in a culture that prioritizes self. Join us as we explore who the church is and how it functions, witnessing the passion of the early believers as they fearlessly preached the gospel, breaking barriers and reaching out to all corners of the world. Our scripture passage this morning comes from Acts chapter 1. Hear the word of the Lord. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instruction through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witness in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Thank you for reading that, Adam. As you can see, we're starting a new series today. And it couldn't be more fitting for us to start a series going through the book of Acts because we've just celebrated the resurrection last week. And so what we're going to do is we're gonna, we're gonna do a book series through Acts for a while. I'm really excited to dive into this book. And what we're gonna see is the story continues on. We're gonna be reminded in, of how the church starts and how it functions and the different things that it's gonna encounter through the way. If you are familiar at all with the book of Acts, there are so many different things in this book that we're gonna come up against. We're gonna find that the church has to navigate challenges. God's gonna do miracles. God is gonna change their ways of thinking. And all of these things are really helpful for us as we navigate what does it mean to be the church in 2024? How do we make decisions as a church? How do we do some of those things? Well, I would say to you today that this book (laughs) is really helpful. And what we really want, what I really want to see happen in this book series, we just want to let the Word of God speak to us. You know, sometimes we have to fight the challenge of bringing things to the Word. We want to let the Word speak to us first. And so I'm so excited to start this series What it really is about is the Spirit of God breaking forth in a way that had never been seen before because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Spirit going out. And so what we're going to see is that, you know, we're going to find things about the church, how it functions, how it makes decisions, how they set up structures. It's going to be about people like Peter, right? A lot of the chapters about Peter in this early Jerusalem church. We're going to find out about Paul and his whole conversion But really, this series, the hero of this book is Jesus Christ. And it is the Holy Spirit taking the work of Jesus out in these concentric circles further and further and further to the entire known world. And it's no accident, uh, and as we study this, that this story as we start here today, that it starts in Jerusalem, 
Right? It starts in the place that Christ was crucified and he rose from the dead. And it's not an accident that this story in Acts in chapter 20 ends in the capital city of Rome. Right? Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, is going to use these really great paved roads and stuff that Rome built to take his gospel out to the entire known world. And what we're going to find out with this early first century uh, world is going to find out is that there is a new king in town. And his name is Jesus Christ. It's not Caesar, it's Jesus. And that's what these early Christians are going to be proclaiming. That's the kind of stuff that we've been singing about already. That's the good news. I want to say a couple things uh, before we jump into the text. Some kind of historical, cultural, like we got to kind of say a couple things about this book. What is it? What is it not? And we're going to be doing this a lot of the way through so that we can make sense of what we're studying so that we don't misinterpret it. The book of Acts is really interesting because it's, it's a mixed genre. There's history in it. There's biography in it. There's narrative. There's theology. There's apologetics. It's got all this different stuff. And it's written probably 50 to 60 years after Jesus rises from the dead. So it's, it's, it's not being written right as it's happening, right? So he's going to be telling a story. And it's written by this guy, Luke. Have you ever guys ever heard of the Gospel of Luke? Yes, right? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Gospel of Luke. Well, they talk about this kind of like Luke Acts. He writes Acts as well. And Luke's a really interesting guy. He's going to tell this early church story. And he's a kind of a traveling companion of Paul. We find him on journeys with Paul. He shows up in some of his letters. He's talked about as a doctor. He's kind of a historian. He's certainly a good writer. Uh, And what's interesting is he's also, they think that he's Jewish uh, and also Greek speaking. So he's kind of like Paul. Right? He understands the Jewish world. He understands the Torah, the scriptures, but he also knows the Roman and Greek world well. And so he's able to do this thing where he's going to tell this story in a way that he's kind of specifically built to be able to do. Just like Paul is one who's going to take that gospel out. Luke kind of has a blend of both worlds. <clears throat> and as Adam read, he writes this book to this guy, Theophilus. You don't hear that name all the time. I think it means friend of God, if I remember correctly. And he also writes his gospel to the same guy, Theophilus. And Theophilus is most likely kind of Luke's patron. If you don't know what a patron is, think of it like this. Everybody needs someone who's going to pay for all their stuff, right? <laughs> That's kind of like what this guy is. He, is. he is paying for his journeys. He's paying and supplying so that Luke can write these letters and do this thing. He's kind of the guy backing him for these efforts. He seems to be a recent convert. And what Luke says, which is interesting, in in Luke chapter 1, verse 4, he says this about why he writes this gospel to this guy. So that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. He's writing this book of Acts, same idea, so that this early church, so they understand what they're being taught about Jesus. We have to remember this, and we need to remember this every time we open the Bible, but specifically in this series. The people here do not know what we know. There is no New Testament. There's just an Old Testament, and they don't even all have like copies of that on a phone. Right? Right? So Jesus has done all these amazing things. He's risen from the dead. But there's not all these, you know, it wasn't blasted out in a tweet or something. So they don't have all this stuff. They don't have it all worked out. There's not been any councils. There's no apostles' creed. There's no Athanasian creed. They haven't made decisions about all of this kind of stuff. It's kind of like the wild, wild west of Christianity a little bit. And so it's so new. And we have to remember that we know a lot of stuff that they don't know. And they're going to be having to work this out together. And so Luke is going to pick up this story in Acts right where he left off his gospel. And he, he kind of recaps a couple things. He's already talked about Jesus' life. He talks about his death. He talks about the resurrection. He mentions in here that Jesus is on the earth for 40 days in his resurrected body. And if we had time, we'd talk about all the crazy stuff that resurrected Jesus does, like walking through walls and like, I'm sure hoping. Kids, who doesn't want to walk through a wall? Adults, who doesn't want to walk through a wall, right? And he's eating too, which is good. So that's, you know, encouraging to know that hopefully we're going to be able to eat in our resurrected body because 
how much of a bummer would it be if we couldn't eat in heaven? I mean, anyways, I like to eat. There's donut holes today. I'm already thinking about that. Um, and so he's recapping. And then what he's going to do here, which is really interesting, is he's going to give us Jesus' last words. The last things that Jesus is going to say to his disciples. And I would say to you, if you had to write your last words today, my guess would be that you would be intentional and careful about what you said. I would hope, <laughs> I would hope you would, I would hope I would be too. We hopefully wouldn't use the time to kind of vent on a bunch of people that we were frustrated with. Hopefully we would say really intentional and careful things to the people that we love most. And so Jesus' words here really matter. They matter to the disciples and they should matter to us. So we're going to jump into this. And the first thing that we're going to start with is the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is verses 4 and 5. The story of Jesus does not stop with the resurrection. Instead, it continues on through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit into the people of God. Jesus says to his disciples, hey, don't leave. Don't leave Jerusalem. Stay here. The Father has a gift for you. He has a promise. Don't go anywhere yet. And you're going to be baptized. And John did it with water. But I'm going to do it with this Holy Spirit thing. And Jesus has been prepping them for this. If you were to go to John chapter 14, Jesus talks a lot about the Holy Spirit, that he's not going to leave them. He's not going to abandon them. He's going to send this advocate and this comforter, and he's going to be in them, which is hard to imagine. And he's going to bring to remembrance the things that Jesus taught. And so though Jesus is going to ascend to the Father, he's not really going to be gone because the Spirit is going to be in the people. But we have to remember that this would have sounded very strange to them. How is God going to be in people? Right, we're so used to talking like this, but if you really think about it, it's kind of crazy. How is God going to be in people? They might have thought about how God showed up physically in the Old Testament. And the way my mind thinks is I think of the burning bush, right? Right? God shows up in this bush and it's not being consumed, but it's fire. Okay, that's interesting. God leads the people through Exodus with, with smoke and fire. You know, Elijah's calling fire down from heaven on sacrifice. There's a lot of fire going on with this spirit of God. How's that going to work? Is fire going <laughs> to... Not, not a coincidence that in the next chapter, next week, we'll talk about the Holy Spirit shows up as tongues of fire. But what's really interesting is Jesus says, I've got this gift. The Father has this gift for you. And this is incredible. God himself is going to dwell in people. Amen. That's, this is incredible. You had the same reaction that disciples did. Don't worry. They don't seem too excited about it either. I'm just joking. I mean, not about, they don't have a good reaction. He says this thing, this Holy Spirit's going to come. God who showed up as fire, he's going to come into you. And Luke doesn't record, they don't even, unless they don't tell us, there's no like follow-up questions. There's no like, yeah! There's no like, wait, is he going to like burn us up? Are we going to live? What's going to happen? Instead, they, they seem to have something else on their mind. And that something has to do with their current political and social situation as a nation. They ask this question. Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit. And they say, all right, they get around him. Okay, Jesus, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel at this time? So Jesus is like, Holy Spirit's coming. They're like, what about the nation of Israel? And Jesus' kind of short answer is, yeah, don't, <laughs> don't worry about that right now. I've been wanting to talk about something else. Lord, are you going to restore? Are you going to fix all of this stuff that's broken? I think we could probably resonate with a question like that. The question is, why are they thinking this? Why is this on their mind? And if you were to look back at the story, and this verse was actually on the screen on Good Friday, if you were here, from Luke 24, on the road to Emmaus. So right after Jesus resurrects, 
the tomb's empty, but they, they, don't, they haven't figured it out yet. There's rumors that Jesus is gone. They don't know what's quite happened. And two of them are walking this road, and Jesus, Jesus walks with them. They don't know it's Jesus, which is awesome. And, you know, Jesus is kind of like, well, what's been going on? Kind of playing dumb. If you don't think God plays dumb, he does. And so they're telling Jesus about all the stuff that happened to Jesus. And one of the things they say is this, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Think about how it's such a sad verse. We thought he was the one who was going to fix everything. They were waiting for the restoration. They thought the Messiah was going to come and fix everything. They thought they were going to get their land back. That he was going to overthrow Rome. They were going to get their borders back. They are going to get their cities back. They were going to get all the people of the land that had taken their land. Remember, they've been exiled for longer than we've been a country. They have been ruled by other people. God, when are you going to do that? Jesus, when are you going to restore what was promised to us? And I want to share with you, there's good reason for them thinking that. I want to read to you a verse from Jeremiah 33. A couple of verses, actually. Starting at verse 11, it should be on the screen as well. So it says, Yet in the towns of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem that are deserted, inhabited by neither people nor animals, there will be heard once more the sounds of joy and gladness, the voices of bride and bridegroom, and the voices of those who bring thank offerings to the house of the Lord, saying, Give thanks to the Lord Almighty, for he is good. His love endures forever. Listen, for I will restore the fortunes of the land as they were before, says the Lord. Verse 14. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of of Israel and Judah. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. For this is what the Lord says, David will never fail to have a man to sit on the throne of Israel, nor will the Levitical priests ever fail to have a man stand before me continually to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to present sacrifices. Sure seems like God's going to restore Israel, right? They've been waiting for it. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is, as is the way that God often does does things, it's a little bit different than what their expectations were. Has God met every one of your expectations? No, right? Because he's God and we're not, and his ways are way cooler than ours. And better, but we don't always understand that. The thing sometimes that we're looking for is not exactly what God wants to do in our lives. And it was the same here. They had this idea of what God was going to do, but it wasn't working. His kingdom, instead of establishing this this localized small kingdom, God's like, I'm going to do something in people's hearts that's going to go out into the entire world. It was so much bigger and better. Let me tell you what I think about when I was studying this. This tells you how much of an old man I'm becoming. So my kids know this. I'm like a progressive commercial you know, like you become, your homeowner becomes your parents or whatever. And I obsess about our grass. Anybody like really care about their lawn? There's a couple of you. It's okay to admit it. Um, I just, I don't know what, I could just stare at it, right? And so we had to put some grass in our backyard. So my front lawn, I have this fescue grass, whatever. It looks green. It's nice. But if my dog looks at this stuff, it burns, okay? If, my kids, if a kid like plays on it, it just crumples, and it looks green, it's great, but it doesn't spread. It's just, it just, it's right there. And the grass in my backyard is a stuff called St. Augustine. I knew it should have been better because it's named after a saint. And this stuff is kind of like a weed. It spreads, right? You can plant it in pods, spaced apart, and it spreads out, and it gets thick. You know, even if my dog pees on it, it eventually grows back. It's awesome, right? All the grass people know what I'm talking about. Here's what I picture. The disciples think Jesus is going to come with a big old thing, a sod, fescue, and he's just going to like 
Dirt's gone, green grass, we're good. Instead, Jesus is up with like 12 little tiny pods of St. Augustine. Is like, we're going to plant these, you know, pretty far apart and wait 2,000 years. It's going to be a progressive and expanding kingdom like a mustard seed, like Jesus talks about. It's actually going to be way greater and radical than what you're picturing. But it is going to be different than what you thought. And Jesus has this thing that's so much better than we could have ever thought. And he's saying, hey, don't get focused on the wrong thing. And we do this, right? They're like, when are you going to restore the kingdom? In our culture, when is Jesus going to come back? How many books are written about this? How many people think they figured this thing out? Let me tell you right now, nobody has. Because Jesus isn't telling. You know what we know? He's going to come back. That's about it. (laughs) When, how, what it's going to look like, I don't know. And what Jesus says is, it's not for you to know those things exactly. Instead, stay focused on being a witness for me about the resurrected Jesus. We can tend to focus on the wrong thing. The, the return of Christ should bring us hope. It should not be the thing we're focused on every day. We are to focus on being filled with the Spirit to live here and now. God will take care of when he comes back. I'm very, very confident of that. And so picture this like as a conversation where you know, Jesus is trying to have, they have a meeting and then the disciples kind of keep redirecting the conversation somewhere else. And Jesus is like, I don't, I, we're, our meeting is about the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so Jesus comes back to that. And they ask this question. He says, it's not for you to know the times or the dates, but you will receive power. So he redirects back to this thing that he's been wanting to talk about. The empowering of the Holy Spirit. It's verse 8. The most impactful and astounding event that happened in the early church was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I want you to think about this for a second. Jesus' death and resurrection are incredible, but the outpouring of God himself into God's people is right up there. If that doesn't happen, then the gospel can't go out. This is so incredible, and I think that we miss this a little bit. This is the thing that Jeremiah spoke about in chapter 31 of his book. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, and I will write it on their hearts. God with his people by being in his people. I'm going to keep saying this because it's absolutely incredible that God would dwell within us and that that's how his kingdom is actually going to go out. So what are we talking about when we talk about God's spirit or the Holy Spirit dwelling in us? What does that even mean? What do we mean by the Holy Spirit? I'm glad that you asked that question. I want to read something. This is one of our confessions. Uh, We hold the three confessions. One of them is called the Belgic confession. It's the oldest reformed kind of statement of faith, so to speak. And article 11 is called the deed of the Holy Spirit. I want you to listen to this. It's going to be on the screen too. This is the spirit that Jesus is saying is going to come upon these disciples and has come into every believer here who's put their faith in Christ. We believe and confess also that the Holy Spirit proceeds eternally from the Father and the Son, neither made nor created, nor begotten, but only proceeding from the two of them. In regard to order, he is the third person of the Trinity, of one and the same essence, and majesty and glory, and with the Father and Son. He is true and eternal God, as the Holy Scriptures teach us. This is not some tiny little baby spirit thing. This is full-blown God himself in spirit of the same essence, of the same majesty, of the same glory proceeding from the Father and the Son. That, that is the thing that is available to us. That's incredible. I wonder how often we think of it like that. 
it's challenging. It's challenging for me. It's exciting. It's a little bit scary if I think about that, to be honest with you. That is what's available. Think about this. This spirit is being given not just to these Israelites, but he's going to be given to people regardless of age. So whether you're six years old or nine or whether you're 95, age doesn't matter. Whether you're a man or a woman, same spirit. Whether you're Jew or Gentile, whatever country you come from, whatever language you speak, whether you have a lot of money or no money, whether you're disabled or not disabled, whatever the thing, the spirit is available to all people who put their faith in Christ. Think about how monumental this is going to be for these early Christians who are initially thinking of this just being a Jewish thing. And think about how many of us still today kind of keep our faith to certain groups of people, if we're honest. And how challenging this could be for us if we're honest. So I want you to think about this. The disciples are are thinking about this kind of kingdom of restore the nation of Israel. And Jesus is saying, I want to give you a promise of the Father. I want to give you the Holy Spirit. I want you to think about which one is greater Sometimes we think, I want the physical, I want to see the kingdom. But what Jesus is going to do through the outpouring of the Spirit is going to be beyond anything that they could have ever imagined. It's so much better just because it's going to stretch out for generations and generations. And it's not unlike something he does as a rabbi. In, in Mark chapter 2, remember the story. Jesus is preaching in a home. And it's super crowded. There's some religious leaders hanging out. And there's four friends who want to get their, their paralyzed friend to Jesus. Remember this? We've probably heard this before. So they undo the roof and they, I don't know if they have a pulley system. I don't know how they got him down. But they get him down somehow. They mess up this guy's roof. And they drop him down. And Jesus is teaching. And everyone's watching. Remember this guy's uh, paralyzed. So we can't walk. And Jesus says to him, your sins are forgiven. It's powerful, but the man's probably like, you know, I can't walk. Like, that'd be great if you could heal me too. And so Jesus says, because the religious leaders are like, hey, 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 you can't do that. You can't forgive sins. He says, so that you know that the Son of Man has authority on this earth to forgive sins, rise up, take up your bed and walk. And he heals him as well. And I think that, at least when I look at that story initially, I tend to think, Whoa, he told the guy to stand up and walk. That's incredible because I can't do that. But I don't think that's what we're supposed to see. Because miracles happen. God works through people to do miracles. You know what we can't do? Is forgive the sins of somebody else. Only God can do that. Because when we sin, we sin against God. We violate God's law. So when we do something, we need forgiveness from God. I haven't actually sinned against a person, right? It's I'm violating God. And so what's happening is what was harder was to forgive sins because only God could do that. And Jesus is doing kind of a similar thing here. He's saying, no, no, you think that the restoration of a physical kingdom is a big deal? Oh man, you have no idea what is coming. And none of us would be sitting here if that Holy Spirit hadn't been poured out. And if the disciples don't do the things that Jesus calls them to do, none of us would be here, which is really incredible to think about. It makes me think about, well, gosh, if we don't, what if we don't do the things God's called us to do? What is the generations beyond us? What are we, what are we going to do for the people coming after us, right? Are we going to be faithful to be filled with the Spirit and the way that God wants to fill us? <clears throat> Remember this too, and we've talked about this in the last few weeks. There was this thing called the Holy of Holies, Right, where the Spirit of God dwelled, where the priests would go in once a year, right? And this is, it's surrounded by this curtain that's probably about four inches thick of woven cloth, 30 feet high. It's a serious drape, okay? And the priests would go in once a year with blood to atone for the sin of the people. And when Jesus Christ dies on the cross, the gospels say that that was ripped and taught from top to bottom. And it's as if the Spirit of God breaks out of that. The presence of God is available and he's 
comes and he says, I want to now make my home in you. Think about how amazing that is. I don't want us to miss this. What we're going to see as we continue in Acts is that this is flooring to these early disciples. They're used to God having to approach God with uh, ceremonial rites and doing things so that they do not offend the holiness of God, not saying the wrong things, not, not putting enough blood on this. And there was all these rituals. And now God is out of the box. And God's going to come into them. I mean, this is, this is just absolutely incredible when you think about it. And I don't think that we think about it enough. I personally do not think about this enough. What would it change in my life if I believed every day that the very Spirit of God was in me? I mean, how would it change the way that you look at your kids or the way that you look at your spouse? The way that you look at your home? Or your boss at work that's just a real, you know? You know what I'm talking about. Or a little, a friend at school, kids who sometimes is mean to you, someone who's bullying or or these things. What would it change if we knew that God was with us, all of us? And not just say, but he's empowered us. How might that change things? And so what Jesus is getting at is he's saying, hey, don't focus on this thing. Instead, be empowered by my Holy Spirit to live the life that I'm calling you to. I've given you a gift. And that gift is going to take these disciples out. And this is what happens is that Luke here gives us kind of a road map for the rest of the book of Acts. He says that you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And that's really what's going to happen in this book. We're just going to see it going further and further and further out. And it's interesting because it's not as if Judaism is going to go out because Judaism is already all around the known world. Remember, they've been exiled. So even when Paul's going to go on all his missionary journeys and stuff, if you remember, he always stops in the synagogue. The synagogues are already there because they've been living there for a really long time already. They've been dispersed. And so what's going to happen now is that These disciples are going to go out and they're going to go preach the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They're going to preach the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We're going to see God do things that only God knew that he was going to do. They're going to preach the risen Jesus. And they're going to be witnesses. And this word is where we get our word martyrs from. A lot of these disciples are going to end up giving up their lives for this. But they are so empowered, they are so overjoyed, they are so sure of what they've experienced and seen and received from the Spirit that they will never recant of their faith. Never. And they're going to go out and do incredible things. And for them, it's like what God has given them is better than anything that the world could offer. And so they can let go of all these worldly things and they can do what God has called them to do. And I think we can learn from this. Now what's interesting too is, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but when it says that um, there's the Holy Spirit, you'll receive power. That word power, it really kind of speaks of supernatural power. And so God does miracles and, and we're going to see in the book, God does like crazy stuff. But I want us to think about this and maybe God will... God works miracles and God does all sorts of stuff. But also, the Holy Spirit works in us, I think, to give us kind of God-given abilities to do normal things in remarkable ways. For example, supernatural power to love people. When the Spirit comes upon you, we have the opportunity to offer people almost like supernatural forgiveness. Forgiveness that they're not experiencing in the world. Giving people mercy that they're not receiving in the world. Extending radical generosity to a world. Supernatural hospitality to people who are being pushed away. What if we let them into our homes and give them a meal? 
these kind of normal things done with the power of the Spirit, these things will transform our community. In fact, I would say they might renew our communities through the love of Jesus. That's what our vision is. And so don't just think about making, you know, people who can't walk stand up. What about offering forgiveness to somebody that's never been offered forgiveness? Offering love to someone who's only received hate. Imagine what that changes for people. And when we're filled with the Spirit, it's almost as if you can't. I remember so distinctly. So Kayla and I got married on July 31st of 2009. We're coming up on 15 years. I know, it's amazing. And uh, thank you. Uh, and when we, you know, after the, the, the ceremony, we were declared husband and wife. I remember we were going back to that, and I was like, I was so jacked. I was so excited. Like one, she said yes. It was like, oh my gosh, right? Uh, if you marry up, you know what that feels like. Um, but I was so overwhelmed by the love I was feeling for my wife and receiving from her that I remember, you know, you walk around uh, to all the tables. You have to, you know, they make you, you have to say hi to everybody, right? Thank you for coming. And you hug everybody. Um, and then you don't get to eat because that takes forever. Um, but I was so overwhelmed with love that I felt like I was in love with everybody. And there were some people there that were not super lovable. Like I can think of some family members in particular. Um, and, but I was, it was like, I, could, I was just so filled that I was just, it was incredible. What if, like, I want that feeling for everybody around me all the time. What if we're so filled with the Spirit that we start to see people the way God sees them? Imagine what that could do for our community. Imagine what that would do for other people. And one of the things that helps us live into that is the last part, which is the ascension and the promise of Christ's return. The ascension of Christ is the guarantee that Jesus' work of salvation is complete and that he will come back again. So I want to try to say this so it makes sense. Because we talk about Christ's work being completed, like it's done. So it's like, well, why do we, <laughs> why do we have to do anything? So the ascension, Jesus is going to, he's going to, we don't have time to get into it, he's going to float up and like disappear. I don't even know. It's awesome. But it marks that the work that Jesus came to do for salvation is done. It's complete. Sin, death, evil have been dealt with. We are forgiven. And so he ascends to the Father. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. It's done. But now the work of the church, empowered by the Holy Spirit, is to go take that gospel out. So Jesus has done the thing. It is victory. It is done. Now we're going to go tell everyone what's been won. And so we get to live knowing that it's already been won. And God's going to fulfill it and complete it when he wants. But it makes the way that we approach life different when we know that Jesus' ascension means that this is for sure. Right? His death becomes our death. His resurrection becomes our resurrection. It's sure. And it tells us that though Jesus' work physically is done, our work here is not. And so we go forth in the power of the Spirit to take the gospel out to wherever God is calling us to go. And it also reminds us that, yes, he has not forgotten us. He will come back. And so we might as well stay focused on doing what he's called to do. And so Jesus ascends, and the disciples are, I can imagine, just like, what just happened? Looking up. And then the angels show up, and they're like, what are you guys looking at? And you're like, what kind of question is that? Like, if you know what we're looking at. And I love this because, you know, they say he's going to come back again. And I, I've been thinking about this question, why do you stand here looking up? And I think for all of us, you know, we want to kind of stay looking at something and focus sometimes just like on the wrong thing, like we talked about earlier. And the invitation, I think, today is, you know, hey, God's going to deal with finishing all the stuff. 
It's time to be focused on being filled by the Spirit and going out and doing the things that God has called us to do. Wherever, whether you're dropping your kids off at school, whether you're going to Starbucks, whether you're going to work, whether you're going to the beach, whatever you do, do it for his glory. Do it knowing that the Holy Spirit is in you and wants to work through you. Sometimes we're just gazing up at the wrong things. And I would say to us, we just got to stop looking up. <laughs> like, he's going to come back. Let's just stay focused. This is interesting. In John 21, 5, at the end of the revelation, there's this, this picture of the new heavens and new earth. It's really beautiful. Sin and death, all of that gets wiped away. It's just so beautiful. You should read it today if you haven't read it. So it says, the Father says this, Behold, I am making everything new. Now to catch it though, he's making it new. He doesn't say, I made it new. It's not done yet. I'm making it new. See, we get to be part through the Holy Spirit of helping God make this earth new. To renew it. To see people come to Jesus. To see families restored. Communities transformed. That's what we get to be part of. That is exciting because he has risen. And even more than that, he's given us his spirit. And we're going to learn so much more about that next week and the weeks to come about what the spirit is doing. But man, that is something to get excited for. That is something that we could live for. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for all that you've done for us. It's hard for us to even imagine what it means for your Holy Spirit to be in us. And God, I pray that you would give us the courage to think more about that. As we come to the table here, May we be reminded of all that you've done for us. Be reminded that you've won and you've overcome death and you've given us your spirit and you want us to extend your love and your salvation to, to the world around us, God. We thank you for all that you're doing, God. We thank you for your great love for us, especially as it's going to be displayed at your supper that you invite us to. We pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.